Yeah, so my name is Konstantin Rusch. I'm a PhD student at ETH uh, in Zurich. Uh, my PhD is officially in applied mathematics, but I work almost exclusively on machine learning, like many people these days, I guess. Um, my supervisor is Siddhartha Mishra, who unfortunately couldn't make it today. Um, and yeah, so this paper is together also with Benjamin Chamberlain and James Rowbottom from Twitter Research and Michael Bronstein, also Twitter and Oxford. And yeah, so I guess I prepared a few slides, but you already told me that this is really meant to be some kind of discussion. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I think James and Ben will just, just check the, the comments section basically and will answer any questions there or just, just tell me about, about some comments because I can't really see them. I, I never figured out if you can do that in Zoom if you share in full screen mode. Um, I can't. So, so please just, just interrupt me and tell me if there are some, some kind of questions in the comments. Perfect. All right. Then I guess I just start. So our work on craft-coupled oscillator networks appeared or will appear at ICML this year. And uh, so the first question is, okay, so why should we care, care about oscillators and why should we put them in craft neural networks? Um, so if you have some kind of physics background, oscillators are absolutely not new to you, right? So even the, the famous high energy theoretical physicist Coleman said once that the career of a young theoretical physicist consists of treating the harmonic oscillator in ever increasing levels of abstraction. And it was really true. So if you have done some kind of classical mechanics, then quantum mechanics, quantum field theory course, and so on, you have seen it like all over the place. Um, but yeah, so, so basically oscillators are very, very much everywhere in nature and in engineering systems. The most famous examples you probably also learn in high school is that of a pendulum without any damping or that of a mass attached to a string. Uh, or even in economics, some kind of business cycles. Um, in, in medicine, heartbeats, ECG or ECC measurements. Um, <clears throat> but what we actually are most interested in or what gave us really some kind of high level motivation to look at oscillators for GNNs is that of the firing of the action potential of neurons. So some of you may have seen the Fitzunagumo model where you basically accumulate and then you fire at some kind of relaxation oscillator. And um, for instance, I have two figures here. I think it's just some kind of uh, cortical column, which is just a bunch of neurons in the cortex, um, which were measured in vivo and in vitro. And you can basically see um, this, this oscillatory behavior there. So basically, I think these are alpha or gamma rays uh, waves or something like this. And, and so basically, <clears throat> like, like a lot of stuff you do in neurobiology, also if you um, model it mathematically with Fitzunagumo or uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model, <clears throat> it's all based on oscillators. Of course, they're kind of complicated, but um, at, at the, the basic parts of it is just oscillators. Okay, so um, now is the question, okay, why should we care about oscillators for GNNs? Well, first we have this neurobiological motivation, as I just said, or so a single biological neuron um, can be seen as, or can be interpreted as some kind of oscillator. Um, but if you actually think about the brain, it's, it's not a single neuron, it's like many, many neurons and they are connected with each other uh, with like synaptical connections and so on. And- um, Wait, but it, Constantine. Yeah. Like, what does it mean to have an oscillator as a GNN? Like, now the solution of the oscillator is the output of the GNN? Um, okay, more like the message passing paradigm is um, identified with oscillations, basically. Um, I hope I, I will make it more clear in the next two slides. Um, this is really just, okay. just like the, the high level motivation why we actually care about oscillators maybe in this GNN framework. Um, no. So uh, yeah, basically if, if you think about the brain, like, like it, it's, it's pretty much like, like a graph, right? So the neurons can be seen as the nodes and the synaptical connections between the neurons can be seen as edges. And so it just makes a lot of sense because like those, as I said before, those individual neurons, they, they, they have this oscillatory behavior and they are coupled through some kind of craft structure. 
So this leads already to, to our um, motivation of graph coupled oscillators. And I will explain in a bit what I actually mean about that. But if you think about it in, in more of a mathematical term, um, it makes a lot of sense to look at oscillators because first, um, they're very expressive. So if you've done some, some math in, in undergrad or whatever, um, you have seen Fourier series approximation where you can basically approximate any continuous or L2 function by some combination of sinusoidals, just some kind of combination of oscillators. So you are not restricted to only learn or approximate oscillatory data, but basically any function you want, almost every function. Um, also, which is super nice is that oscillators, the, the gradients of oscillators are just well behaved. Just think about sinus. I mean, the, the, um, the, the gradient of sinus is just cosinus. And um, so sinus is bounded between minus one and one, right? And if you take the gradient of cosinus, you have the same behavior. So basically the gradients are super nicely behaved. They are stable in some sense. Um, and so the idea might be if we have a very, very deep neural network, in this case, a GNN, um, we might have to deal with the exploding vanishing gradients problem. And the hope is that if you use oscillators, we can mitigate that. Um, I will explain in, in very much detail later on what I mean by exploding vanishing gradients problem, because I know that in the GNN community, it's not, it's not that central yet, but the, the deeper we go basically um, with the GNNs, um, at some point we have to deal with this problem. So for RNNs, you pretty much have to deal with it all the time because the depth is given by this, the length of the sequence and just imagine having a sequence length of 2000. That means basically a, a deep neural network of depth 2000 and this is just very deep. Um, the, the most important uh, property is, is what I would say the, the stability property of oscillators um, the kind of um, energy conserving property. And so the hope is that because of that, we can maybe even overcome the oversmoothing problem. So this is just the motivation, the high level uh, motivation for us basically to look at those kind of formulations because we think it's great for expressivity. It can solve the exploding range and gradient problem and we can solve oversmoothing. Um, of course, we have to do much more theory and I will, I will show basically what, what we have done later on, but this is literally just the high level motivation. Um, are there any questions about, about that so far? Okay. Well, a lot of them, but I guess we'll get into that. Yeah, okay, okay, that's fair. Um, okay, so, so let me start by just a very gentle introduction to mathematical modeling of oscillators because I'm not too sure if everyone has seen that in, in their undergrad or high school or wherever. Um, so the, the easiest or the, the, the best way to start is just to look at the simple harmonic oscillator. And you can think of that, for instance, as uh, the, the spring mass system. So you have a spring here, you attach a mass to it, and then it goes up and down, up and down, and it's undamped. So you just assume you don't lose any energy. And uh, basically the position of this mass, um, uh, if you track that through time and you plot it through time, you literally just um, get the super nice harmonic oscillator. In this case, with, this, uh, with the initial condition, you just get a sinus. Okay, uh, and you can model it with a so-called ordinary differential equation. People probably know it from neural ODEs. Um, ODEs are much older than, than deep neural networks, I guess. So um, yeah, but, but people these days in machine learning, they know ODEs because of neural ODEs, I guess. Um, but yeah, so we can basically model the, the harmonic oscillator with this differential equation. The prime just means that this is the derivative with respect to time and x is a function. So we literally just have the second derivative with respect to time equals uh, minus the function. And there, there are, for those simple ODEs, there are ways to solve it analytically, but you can also just trust me or put in that solution to see that actually this function, just a combination of sine and cosine um, solves this ODE. Um, the A and the B are just given by the initial condition. So an ODE, you can only solve uh, if you have an initial condition. And so initial condition just means like at time zero, uh, uh, what value does the function have at that time? For instance, if yeah, you so said, yeah. Like we, we have some, some position X 
and we know that its second derivative should be minus uh, minus the position. Yeah, and uh, like now we could go ahead and run a few steps of this uh, simulation, right? Um, where we start with some position and then we always apply this rule of minus the position should be the second second derivative. Uh, well, no, we can't really do that, right? We we would need to, um, yeah, we, we can't yet like do an Euler, or do some Euler steps to approximate the, the evolution of the position over time. Could we do that here? Yeah, we, we can totally do that. What you usually do is you ref, you reformulate a because this is a second order ODE because we have a second yeah, uh, order. Yeah, to... exactly. Okay. So so what we do usually is we rewrite it as a first order ODE. Um, I will show it in the next slide how you do it exactly. But basically, you just introduce a um, auxiliary variable. Let's call it y, and you set y to x prime. Okay then you can yeah. basically set, well, if y is x prime, then x double prime is y prime, right? So you have yeah. y prime equals minus x and, and x prime equals now y. As the, as the next thing you just have that we can also add like some, uh, some friction or something like that. And then as the third thing you show that we now have two, two objects and people usually model that with some, a function of both of the positions exactly yeah so so the, the next step would be because this this is not very realistic right even for that the, the system will lose energy over time so what you do is you um, basically add some damping term which is just proportional to the velocity so the derivative of the position x is just the velocity right and um, <clears throat> so you can add some damping term and I plotted it here. So we have in blue just the harmonic oscillator. And if you add some damping, I said alpha to 0 0.1 here, um, you can see that it really gets damped and basically the oscillation amplitude converges to zero. Um, and this is much more realistic, right? And now, as you said, we, we even want to, to look at several oscillators so a system of oscillators so we don't only have like a one dimensional x but it's now higher dimensional it can be two two dimensions at least and we couple those oscillations and we couple it through some coupling function i call here just f it can be for instance just a linear transformation so here for instance in this plot i showed a 2d coupled oscillator and w is just a random matrix the entries are just uniform random numbers and you can see how complicated the dynamics already looks like, right? It almost looks like it's chaotic. It's not because it's two dimensional and continuous, but it almost looks like it's 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 chaotic. Um, so you can really not not predict like the, the next steps of the dynamics, like analytically at least. Um, and that brings me to the next point. So this formulation, although it's linear, although it's only two dimensions, it's already too complicated to solve it analytically. And you really need to run simulations. So for that, we can just 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 solve it analytically like this, but this is already too complicated to do it. And we need to use Euler, for instance, but there are better methods to do it than Euler. Okay, but now to bring this into the graph world, um, then we start with some some features X, or yeah, our positions are now just some node features. And uh, okay, yeah, exactly. But, uh, that brings me to my, to my next slide, actually. Yeah, I'll look at you. Okay, so yeah, so the question is now, how do we get this oscillatory behavior in our message passing paradigm, right? Or I, I just say it, how, how do we get that for GNNs? And so first, we just have to settle for notation. We just have a graph G, we have nodes V and edges E, yeah. and Good. node feature X. And as you said, now we want to propagate basically those node features X um, through this oscillatory dynamics. And what we do is we basically write the oscillatory ODE system we had before, this coupled oscillatory ODE system we had before. And if you forget about this term for a second and just look at X double prime equals minus uh, gamma times X, this is the simple harmonic oscillator, right? Um, the, the dimensions are uncoupled. They just all oscillate with frequency gamma. 
Uh, we can add some friction or damping like we did before. So if we add this term, then we have some damping. But now comes the interesting part. Now we want to couple those oscillators, right? Because so far they are completely uncoupled. But we want to couple them and we do it by putting it through a nonlinear function. And this nonlinear function is actually a learnable one neighborhood coupling, meaning it can be just your, your most favorite um, GNN uh, architecture. It can be a GCN, it can be a GET, it can be something much more complicated. Um, the, the only thing we want to, to ensure here is that we basically have a function from uh, basically our node features again to the node features. And um, we want to couple basically um, through the graph structure. And so really the, the um, elements here are really given only if the edges are, if the nodes i and j are connected through an edge. So this just means that i and j is basically connected by an, by an edge and i and j are just nodes. Um, so the, the, the coupling here is sparse in some sense because in the, in the slide I showed you before where we had this two-dimensional coupling of the linear oscillators, we, I basically had this W matrix, right? I had this, this just fully connected matrix and this would mean this is just a fully connected graph, right? But now we introduce some sparsity and we really couple just through the graph structure itself. And again, we have some activation function sigma. It's usually just ReLU, can be tan H, whatever. And we use some control parameters, gamma and alpha, which are just um, constants. They should be bigger than zero um, or just set to zero would also be okay, which just are control parameters controlling the frequency and controlling the damping. And as I said before, so what you usually do is you rewrite the second order ODE to a system of first order ODEs by introducing this help variable y and just setting it to x prime, then you can set this x prime to y and you can basically set x double prime to y prime, right? And then you just rewrite it like this. So if you've done some ODE class analysis, you can see basically that you can rewrite every nth order uh, ODE to a first order system of ODEs. Okay, so if I now um i have my bunch of nodes and i imagine them all as oscillating in some first of all if we only have the minus gamma x then they're just oscillating forever in their um sine cosine combination thing. yeah yeah and then if we add the minus alpha x dash then all of my nodes are simultaneously let's say they all start at the same level and they're all simultaneously still oscillating but after some time they get damped and then just converge to a constant and now we um now the oscillation of one node is influences this oscillation of another node like the features of oscillating in one node influence the features oscillating in another node and then this is how what we express through this f theta like whenever we have some a node connected to to or whenever a node has a few edges that connected to other nodes then it has to look at the other nodes to know how how the features will change their oscillation in the next time step. Exactly, yeah, yeah. pretty much exactly like that, yeah. Perfect. Okay, and then how, if we now look at your, uh, sorry, Ben, you wanted to say something? I was, I was just gonna say, if you just think of the nodes as particles located in feature space and they're just oscillating in feature space, and that's, that, that's the, the right picture, I think. Mm. Okay, exactly. We have this figure here. I will show it in a second. So. Um, okay. Yeah. And you there, you also have this discretization. Yeah, let's get into that. Exactly. So as I said before, even, even a linear two-dimensional coupled system is already too complicated to find an analytic solution. So we have to use some kind of discretization, numerical simulation. Um, and what we do here is we just go for the easiest one which um, is also the fastest one. So you can use some higher order method. No one stops you from doing that. 
but it just takes takes more time right so we just go for the fastest one which is at the same time structure preserving and this is just this IMAX Euler scheme um, semi implicit Euler however you want to call it um, which is just given in this form so we have to introduce a time step delta t um, and then discretize it accordingly um, using this this easy the IMAX scheme. IMAX is, is for implicit explicit because the explicit is the first uh, equation. So we treat that explicitly because we only have n minus one terms on the right hand side. But the implicit um, thing comes from the second equation because we have this n term here. So it's actually this, this updated equation already here. So if you would just use, use plan Euler, you would have also a y n minus one here. Um, but this leads to instabilities and it's not structure preserving and so we lose basically um, the whole structure of the ODE system we are interested in. Can you, can you say that again? If we were using Euler then? Then um, we basically, it, it, it's unstable. So basically the, the oh, oscillatory oh, trajectories would, would explode at some point. Then, what would we have there then in the equation? Uh, um, it's a it's just a y n minus one so it's instead of an n it's an n minus one here that's the only difference um okay so we would be using the output that we get from the above formula from the previous step instead of exactly okay. yeah okay no all right uh another hand raise are you hi um actually I have uh, two questions. The first one is, um, is the points are maintained fixed during the whole experiments? And the second question is, um, from what I understood is that the uh, time steps are maintained fixed. And um, for more complicated experiments, for example, when we have uh, chaotic um, coupled oscill oscillators, I think this uh, parameters of uh, time steps uh, shouldn't be fixed as um, because uh, once the time step is fixed, I think we are losing many informations um, because there is, um, um, I don't know how to say that, but there is uh, modes where there is uh, chaos. So uh, I don't think this information would be captured if we have fixed time steps. I think it, it depends on the, um, on the, uh, how the uh, the oscillators, I mean, the, the, the parameters that describe the, the experiments, for example, if there is chaos, we need um, uh, less time steps, I mean, uh, short time steps compared to uh, other modes. I don't know if that makes sense. So yeah, so so typically what, what people in numerical analysis look at is um, stability of the whole system with respect to the time step, right? So as I said, for instance, Euler, Euler works, even here Euler works, but if you want to have it like, like a stable simulation, you have to go with delta t to zero, basically. So it's, it only works in, in um, basically the limit case of delta t really going to zero, which is just unfeasible for computers. I mean, I don't want to take a million steps just to go from zero to one in my time domain, right? Um, so, so this is really a valid question um, for, for chaotic dynamics, so uh, first of all, we, we, we didn't try any chaotic dynamical system or we didn't try to approximate a chaotic dynamical system. Um, I'm not too sure if the if our system, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if we, for instance, have sigma to be something bounded, uh, this whole system will not be chaotic at all. So it's anyway not a good idea to use something which is not chaotic intrinsically to approximate something chaotic, right? Um, what I understood from your question was more like about multiple scales, right? Because you said, okay, there might be one node which which has to um, oscillate maybe on a high on a way different uh, frequency than the other nodes. Um, this can be done actually through the through the coupling here, um, because you, if this, for instance, is real, you could, for instance, just um, just get some, some constants out of that, right? You just rescale the time and then you have something which is at least, um, which is at least multi-scale in the first update here. Um, but of course you can do many, many things. So uh, what you can do is you can run just something, something time adaptive, um, which gives you better, um, 
uh, better control about the, the stability and the convergence of the of the method. You can also do something like heterogeneous multi-scale methods, where you actually do exactly what you just said, that you update some nodes just way faster than you do the other nodes, so that you really have this kind of multi-scale behavior. So it's open-ended, right? Um, for us, we just stick to this formulation, because if you look at our appendix, it already gets very, very complicated, just having this uh, semi-implicit Euler formulation to prove things. Um, but of course, like the sky is the limit. Um, just, just try it out. It, I mean, it's it's really just a start, and it would be really interesting if you know if you're interested. Just take our code and try some different kind of methods and multi-scale or time adaptive, and see how it works out. Um, we didn't so far. We did a few experiments with, with time adaptiveness, but on the data sets we considered there was no big difference, and it just takes longer. I hope this answered the question more or less. Uh, yeah, thank you. It answers my question. Uh, I have another um, short question. Uh, if if you uh, are no no no, sorry, are you? Let's go with Tom Tom first. Okay. Can you maybe write it in chat if it's not too long? Yeah, Tom. Yeah, I just want to to add a comment here. Like you said that you do not uh, um, you do not try like uh, uh, systems that are chaotic. But in general, like when you have a many body system, like every system is chaotic. So basically like the entire formulation of your, um, of your graph con is indeed a chaotic system, no? Because for example, just a, a double pendulum or just a three body planetary system, you already have chaos there. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, but usually, you know, usually it's it's not bounded, right? In the in the multi-body system, you don't have a bounded term. So that's what I said. So if sigma is is tan h, for instance, so it's bounded between minus one and one, um, I can actually work out a global bound with respect to perturbations um, on the initial states, which probably grows quadratically. I haven't done it. Um, we have something which is related to that. So I think if yeah I agree so so if you if you don't have any any assumptions on sigma, then it's probably chaotic um, or it can be chaotic, but uh, exactly if if I have this this condition on on sigma it's 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 not well I, I would be surprised I haven't done I haven't done the math but uh, I would be surprised because we have something related to it and it was just globally bounded, and then there's no no chaos 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 involved. Okay, but. Uh, here you're trying to model a multi-body system by uh, like you, you're trying to model a multi-body system, for example, like a simple system where you have uh, different masses attached by um, uh, attached by like um, a flexible ropes or something like that. But this system is inherently chaotic, no? Or like well, if you forget about this term, if we just set this term to zero it's just uncoupled oscillators right so it's just one dimensional oscillator so there's nothing chaotic there right it's just you can just solve yeah. it independently for each dimension so there's nothing chaotic if you if you add this this coupling term yeah that there usually comes chaos, uh, chaos behavior like like with it um but as i said like like if you have some kind of assumptions on your activation function it's probably not because the whole dynamics is bounded if you have some kind of conditions also on gamma and alpha and delta t, um, but but yeah, I, I haven't worked it out. So um, there, there might be modes where it's actually chaotic, um, but there are for sure modes where it's not chaotic at all. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. So I'll let you continue the presentation. Awesome, okay. Yeah, or are you, do you want to read out your question? So, yeah, the question is about, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so as, a, as I said, um, I'm wondering if um, you're using the predicted uh, results to uh, propagate the prediction through other time steps. And if so, um, how the variance is uh, propagated to the other results? Okay, I'm, I'm not too sure if I got the question right. Um, what do you mean by... by um... So... Yeah, so, so your model is um, predicting the further time steps. And um, from what I understood, you're using this um, 
predicted results to continue the predictions to other time steps, future time steps. And uh, there is uncertainty that is propagating to um, the future time steps. And I'm wondering the, um, the behavior of um, this var variability that is propagating to um, the future time steps. Okay, I, I got you. Okay, so yeah, I think this is related again to stability. So basically, of course, there's just an approximation and every step you take, you accumulate approximation errors, right? And the question is if it just explodes at some point. Um, yeah, exactly. Answer is it doesn't because we use this semi-implicit step and we use uh, a semi-implicit discretization and we have a damping term here, which anyway helps such that we can actually prove that the whole dynamics is bounded uh, lin uh, quadratically in time. So we actually have a global bound, not only locally, but actually globally. Um, you, you can find it in our camera ready version, which we will upload by the end of this week. Um, yeah, so th this is good news. Something like this won't happen. So if I understand correctly, you don't want the system to oscillate. You want it to converge to a solution. And for that, you need the damping and the implicit term. And it means that the system is stable. Uh, is that correct? No, we don't want it to converge to something. Otherwise, it would over smooth, right? If we just have an insane term of damping here. So if we set alpha to 10, um, it would just, it, it's just, basically, it's just an oscillator, which is completely over damped. So it's, it's more or less just, just diffusion, right? And we don't want that. But diffusion helps in the sense that the dynamics won't explode. So um, it's it's just a bit of, of a balancing of the terms to find a bit of diffusion such that you know your your system is stable, um, but not as much diffusion such that you over smooth over time. But I I will show like like what I actually mean by that also in mathematical terms in, in the next few few slides I think. Um, maybe I, I just explain for a second this nice figure we have here, because this is really um, um, like this, this graph con dynamics visualize what it really does. And we have here um, just, just a graph at initial time, which is actually a sink molecule. Um, and we propagate it forward in time using just our graph con message passing. And you can see that literally like every node oscillates in time. And you know, even after I think that's time step 20, um, not time step, but time 20, um, you can see that that you don't have any shrinkage of, of like the, the graph, right? Um, they just oscillate in very unpredictable ways, um, very complicated. But basically, if you would have chosen GCN, then you just shrink the graph to because the, the node features here, we um, identify them as positions. And so if you over smooth, it would just mean that at some point you just shrink to just one small uh, graph, right? Um, but we don't have that here. What does it mean to represent the uh, features as 2D um, positions? Or how do you do that? Uh, so basically the initial uh, node features are just the initial positions of our graph. We just embedded. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we just embedded basically uh, on a plane um, and we uh, basically, yeah, just identify the initial node features at the initial positions and then okay, we propagate so you, like, those node features. So you have a structure and you pr project it to a 2D plane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah good. Awesome, okay. So. Yeah, okay. Then let me talk a bit about oversmoothing and um, that we actually can overcome over smoothing with, with GraphCon and we can actually prove it. Uh, but to start um, basically the proof, we first have to define over smoothing. Um, I know that there has been many, many def definitions out there, but we have our own, um, which I kind of like. Um, and it's, it's um, well, it uses the DH lead energy, um, which most of you probably know. And if you just look basically at, at the definition of the DH lead energy, you see basically, because these are the, the node features for node i and these are the node features for node j. And basically, if they are very close to each other, this term is almost zero, right? And if you sum up over the whole graph and you normalize, this term will be zero if the, the GNN over smooth is, right? If these are the node features at the final time, basically the output, and they are very close to each other, then this quantity will just be zero or almost zero if the graph, if the GNN over smooth, over smooth is. Um, also the other way around, right? So if the GNN oversmooths, 
those quantities will be close together and then again this will be zero um okay and basically we define our smoothing as uh, the exponential convergence of this Dirichlet energy uh, to zero of um, the layer-wise uh, Dirichlet energy. Um, basically, we just look at the Dirichlet energy at each um, hidden node features. If we propagate it through a GNN, like we have the first uh, GNN layer, so we have our um, X1, then we have the second GNN layer, we have our X2, and so on. And if we go through the deep GNN, if basically the Dirichlet energy of those node features go to zero exponentially fast in that sense, then we say it over smoothes. And I just um, made, made a plot here from where we can see basically the Dirichlet energy, how it evolves over time or over layers. Um, so we just use 100 layers here and you can see GAT and GCN and you can see it's even log log and you can see the exponential convergence to zero. I mean, it's already uh, machine precision at like 20 layers or something. So you can really see that, oh, sorry, that you have this, this over smoothing phenomena um, for guts and GCNs. Of course, since we deal with ODE systems, we have some kind of continuous formulation. We can just extend this discrete formulation also to a continuous formulation where we don't talk about layers, but just as propagation of the dynamics through continuous time. If that, if that makes sense for everyone. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I think I won't go into too much detail how we actually prove that we can overcome um, Craftcon. Let me take a look at the time. Okay, so I have still a bit of time left. Um, okay, so basically, I, I start with the figure just to show you that we can overcome our smoothing. Um, so the same figure I showed before, but now we have Craftcon get Craftcon GCN, which literally just means that the coupling function f is a get or the coupling function f is a gcn okay and we basically plotted for two regimes the first regime is no damping at all alpha is zero the second regime is a very high damping so alpha equals zero to five is already very high so it's almost dominated and you can see that if you don't have any damping at all uh it's it's perfectly stable so it doesn't over smooth at all so it, it basically oscillates around one which is exactly what you want right um, if we if we add some very high damping, um, it decreases the Dirichlet energy, but it it stabilizes at some point. And this is literally what our theory is also telling us. So even if we have high damping in our system, um, the system will stabilize at at some point given the Dirichlet energy. Um, yeah, I, I I think I will not go through through the proof. Um, it, it's in the appendix or, or please just tell me if you're super interested in, in how to basically prove that you can overcome over smoothing with Craftcon. Uh, I will explain the steps here, but if, if no one is, is really interested in, in that, then I can just. Yeah, well, through. can we maybe go a few slides back where you show your IMAX, IMAX, yes. IMAX, IMAX. Yeah, so here, right, if we were to now just use as our uh, maybe maybe I should start drawing here. Uh, annotate. If we were to just now use this as our updated xn, and we, what happened there? Uh, we removed this. Okay, so the drawing doesn't really stop. Uh, the drawing doesn't really work. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. If we were to just use the xn, uh, the, the yn, and now as our updated node features, and we drop the yn minus one, and we drop the minus gamma x and the minus alpha y, then if our f theta is maybe gut, then we would just have the gut update function, right? uh almost right you, you still have this the second update function here or do you also want to to drop that i also want to drop that okay but i said the x the y n is now replaced by x n okay the y n is okay so just have x n equals delta t times this right yes okay yeah then then literally it's just it's just a gut but or, or gcn but there's actually a more interesting connection i will come to it, uh, later because basically, if you run just a fixed point iteration of that system, 
you will recover just a, a normal multi-layer GNN stacking, um, okay. which which is yeah I think even more interesting. But you're completely right. Like like if you yeah. just drop all these terms, okay. then you just have this recursion. No. But now then let's go to your setup that we have written here. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, the your setup that you've written here, right? And now we just uh, set alpha to zero because we still overcome over smoothing, right? If alpha is zero. Even better so. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, all, all that we're doing, right? Is just subtracting our previous node features, no? And then... Yeah. yeah. In a more involved way, right? So, so, um, so, yeah, we subtracted, but then we added back again, right? So, basically, what we updated here, where we subtracted, um, we add back here on the, the 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 node features we had in the in the step before. Yes. So, um, yeah, I, I mean that that's just what what oscillators are, right? You basically um, uh, have the second order dynamics and. You know, yeah um, okay but um uh, what is in your first layer uh, what will you use as xn minus one um so exactly so we need an x zero right in order to start our our dynamics and we just um well you can use just the the initial node values but we usually just use some linear encoding of those because we had usually like the input is given very high dimensional in 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 um, Cora, it's more than a thousand dimensions, wow. right? We don't want to, to run this dynamics in about one thousand di uh, dimensions, wow. or it's given just in five input dimensions, then it's too low dimensional. So we encode it with just some yeah. linear transformation. It was a stupid question. <laughs> um, then yeah, so this is super simple to implement, right? It is. Uh, You're it saying is. it helps. And like it is also super, it's almost just like a skip connection, basically. Or a, yeah, there is skip connect. Yeah, there are skip connections involved, but in a more, um, more involved way, right? <laughs> so, so the I mean, it's literally, it's literally a dynamics we propagate forward, right? And I, I will show in in a few slides that if you just do like the the normal stacking, we just end up converging towards steady states or fixed points of this dynamics. But since we run this more complicated uh, dynamics we have here, we actually can explore the, the, the state space of the node features way better. So we basically explore the, 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 the space around the steady states and not just are doomed to converge towards those steady states. Yeah, but I think I mean... is... sorry. Yeah, I think this is literally the, the argument why in every experiment we see that if we just use this dynamics instead of normal stacking, we always gain uh, a lot of performance, like really a lot. Even just using GCN, we got in, in, in many cases really, really good results. So, yeah. So this is also the, the point I want to make, like it's so easy, as you said, and I can show you our code in a bit, um, which is not public yet, but we will do it in, in a few days. Um, it's so easy to implement and there's nothing which stops you just to use CraftCon instead of a normal multi-layer stacking, right? So if you work on a new GC GNN um, um, architecture, for instance, just put CraftCon around, you know, it probably will help getting better performance. Does anyone here know what deeper GCN does to make their GCNs deeper? Damn, that's sad. <laughs> um uh, i can't remember um sorry yeah so so i mean there's this gcn ii or gcn2 i don't know how people call it right and they just track the initial node features through the dynamics which of course stabilizes things right you just perturbate around those initial states and so you don't over smooth but it's also kind of restricted in basically how rich of a dynamics you can basically found with stress gradient dynamic, uh, stress yeah. gradient descent. What's, what's the y n minus one in the beginning, in your first layer? Uh, y n minus one is the initial velocity, right? And we also encode it. We usually set velocity to position, um, so okay. we encode it just once. Okay, so in the beginning, it is just the same as the 
the node features. Yeah, it, it, it worked reasonably well. So if we, if we can also encode both with different linear transformations, it didn't give any gain in performance. So then if it doesn't gain anything, yeah. then why should we use more parameters, right? Okay, nice. Yeah, I would really like to see how, um, like basically these are just a little more involved skip connections in the end, right? That prevent over smoothing to some degree. And yeah, maybe it, it would be interesting to compare to, I don't know what a deeper GCN got, uh, does, but I'll, I'll look it up while you go on. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, yeah, I think I won't go in, into the proof. So, so maybe maybe two, three sentences. So basically what you do is you look at the stability of the steady states, which are basically, um, uh, uh, which are basically uh, resulting in the oversmoothing. So you can just show this equivalence that the oversmoothing in our definition occurs if those those uh, points here are the, the exponentially stable, stable steady states. And we just, what, what people do in dynamical systems theory, we just linear, linearize around those perturbations. Uh, we check uh, basically this linearized system and we um, well, find a analytic formulation for the energy. And then we do some very careful analysis. Um, it, it's very involved. I mean, um, can you still, can, can you still, still see my? You see my paper, right? Uh, okay, no, perfect. So, we see, so the, we see your slides. Ah, oh, still the slides. Okay, then, then okay, then never mind. So you can take a look at, at the appendix in the paper. The 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 analysis looks looks a bit scary, but it's it's really just just some some terms which tell you that uh, basically the energy around those steady states. Uh, you have dissipative terms, of course. Um, which basically um, lets the energy go to zero, which would mean you have something exponentially stable. Um, but you also have energy production terms, and they actually dominate. And so you literally have an algebraical growth of the energy around those steady states. And so those steady states are not, not asymptotically stable. And so the, the oversmoothing can't happen. But, but if you really want to know all the details, you have to really just take a look at the appendix. It's kind of interesting because it uses the fact that we have a nonlinearity here. So if you wouldn't have a nonlinearity, we wouldn't have uh, those production terms. And also it helps if the adjacency matrix is non-symmetric, which also helps with the production of energy. So from a mathematical perspective, it's, it's kind of interesting. So if you have some kind of math background, it might be interesting for you. No. But yeah, so we can actually show that GraphCon mitigates over smoothing for our defin definition. And you can also see it here in, in this uh, slide and this, this figure. Okay, I would march on to the exploding vanishing gradients problem if I still have time, or do you want me to show the results? Um, I, can, I can just tell you that we can prove the exploding vanishing gradient problem is mitigated for GraphCon. Uh, it's, it's a bit, of tedious calculations i would explain those uh, but i don't know if people are really interested in that do you know if this would also work if you for example always you have skip connections every layer and you have your initial node features added to every layer then do you like now on top of your head know if your proof or something similar would work for that as well to yeah or i mean it would right mm -hmm. if if exactly so if you have a skip connection from the initial node values then yeah you basically uh what what makes the the um exploding mention credit problem is basically this term the influence basically of the the last hidden node features giving some node features before and usually if you just look at set zero which is just the initial node features then, well, it, it would be just this horrible product, right? Um, and if this product on average, like the, the factors are 0.9 and you take this long product, 0.9 to the power of 100 just goes to zero exponentially fast, right? If it's like a big bigger than one, it just explodes. But if you have a skip connection, um, you can go with this term to zero, but still have the skip connection and you have a constant on top here. So of course, yeah, it would work. 
Okay, um, and also but like, again, you lose a lot of dynamics. The energy is also always high, right? If we have um, skip connections from the beginning, or if you always drag along our initial features. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not too sure what you mean by energy. Do you mean the Dirichlet energy? Yes. Yeah. The, okay. Because the the energy I was talking here about is really the energy of the system, and not the Dirichlet energy. Um, but okay. So so yeah, of course. If, if you have the the Dirichlet energy and you track the initial node features, then it's it will always like uh, oscillate maybe around those the energy of the okay. initial node features, right? I missed that. What's the what is this energy versus the Dirichlet energy? Um, so this energy is really the energy of the system. Just think about uh, the harmonic oscillator. Um, you can write down the the energy, which is something like uh, uh, a half, uh, uh, and then basically squared norm of y plus a half squared norm of x. Um, and this corresponds to the Hamiltonian of the system. So if people are interested, can I get it from the Dirichlet energy? Um, no. Um, it's 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 different. Yeah. Um, probably no. Okay. Well, no, you you can't. No. Yeah. But I just have to look up what this energy is. Yeah. I, I can show. Maybe, maybe I stop sharing for a second and then I share my uh, the the um, camera ready version of our paper uh, because then I can show you literally how the how the energy looks like. Yeah. That that would be lovely. Okay. So the energy looks looks like this of uh, of the linearized system. That's literally the energy, and these are the um, production or dissipative terms t one, t two, t three. Yeah. So in some sense, you you have the the definition of Dirichlet energy in there, but it's it's more involved as you can see. Yeah, yeah, but it's still just the. Uh, um like some distance of the like it, it won't go to zero right the energy if we drag uh, if we start with different node features and we drag along our node features and there you also have avoided your over smoothing problem now exactly but but again you just basically uh, uh, perturb around your initial node features so you won't have a very rich dynamics, right? Which probably don't won't lead to to very high accuracies or very high performance. So th this is something that really works. I mean, the the, the guys from GCN II or GCN two um, had had a really nice paper, and it really works, right? And in many cases, it gives really really good results. But I think CraftCon works just better. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Let me march on the slides. Uh, yeah, I, I won't talk too much about the exploding mention credit problem. You can look it up in the camera ready version. It was just pointed out by some reviewers uh, at ICML that now you know now we go very deep. Uh, we should also just um, be careful with if the gradients are actually well behaved or not. Um, but but yeah, so it, it's not in our original version, which is currently on archive, but the camera ready version, which will be added by the end of the week. Okay, so what, what you said, Hannes, uh, a few minutes ago is, is exactly this, this connection to, to the naive stacking. So just recall the, the CraftCon framework we just had the, the whole time. Um, and now just assume that F theta is time independent or autonomous. So you don't have a T in here. Um, it's just a normal GCN, okay? Um, then basically the steady states of the system are given in this form. So Y for all N should be zero because then X just gets updated by the X before, right? And so we have Y um, be zero for all N. So this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. We just put this on the other side, divide by gamma, and then we have the second steady state, um, which is given by this. And now we just run a fixed point iteration. Um, and we see that we basically recover the normal stacking of G and Ns with some scaling factor, which doesn't really matter, right? So it's just the scaling in front of, of the nonlinearity. And um, so we can, can really see that we can basically recover naive stacking uh, as a fixed point iterations of CraftCon. And that really means that um, GNNs are just, if you stack them naively, they're just doomed to converge towards the steady states. 
and CraftCon has the possibility to explore just a richer sampling of the underlying attend feature space, which, uh, well, in, in our experiments always led to way better expressive, expressive power than for standard GNNs. But this is just an argument, right? This is not a formal mathematical proof or something. All right, then let me go on to the results. Um, yeah, I guess we just had, had really good results. And what I particularly like about CraftCon is that it's not only good on homophilic uh, uh, node level prediction or node level classification tasks, but basically on a huge variety of different tasks. So we start with Coruscant, your PubMed, like, like most of the papers, I guess. We got extremely good results. So here we just um, compare GCN with CraftCon GCN, same number of parameters, same, same, everything is the same, but we just um, use CraftCon for the dynamics instead of uh, the, the plain GCN, the same for GET. And you can see that you always get better results. Of course, this is Coruscant, your PubMed, you won't get from 77 to 95 or something, but it's better results and you do almost nothing in order to get it right you just use the, the different dynamics um same for get um and even grant at at that that time was one of the the best working um on on this on this set of of experiments also here it's it's just the um maybe ben can explain it better if he wants to it's we, we do it on the largest connected compo uh, component of, of Cora Sites here, PubMed. So it's a bit different than just uh, the standard uh, fully supervised or semi supervised uh, task. So those numbers might be a bit different to what you've seen in other papers, but basically all methods we compare it to um, has been run or have been run basically on the same experimental setup. Well, and we just use this um, transformers um, attention, which was used in Grant, also for CraftCon, and well, we can also outperform outperform Grant with CraftCon. Right, the the run is just gut with a, a little improved gut. Right? Yeah, so just with and, the Baswani uh, um, attention. Yeah, and you now the same goes for some heterophilic graphs, uh, but can you explain the the test with the super pixel on um yeah with the mnist super pixel stuff like i've seen that a few times but i don't really okay. know what so, yeah so so i think actually it was originally proposed by pronstein's group in the monad um, paper um then you, you you probably can can describe this the setup of this experiment better than than i can yeah F federico who's also at twitter uh, invented this task and I think it was it was it is in Monet, and it's because they were criticized originally, I think, um, by the reviewers for not having a oh, Fede, where are you when I need not the question? <laughs> um I don't know. It's in it's in Monet. Um Fede invented it. If anyone really cares, I can ask him and let you guys know. Yeah, good, good. Then all right. right. Um yeah, it's just some craft level um classification and nothing else. Um you can check the paper benchmarking GNN from uh, VJ Duvedi. He has like, um, I, I'm not sure if it's the same version, but like he also have a form of MNIST uh, super pixels. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But um, time is almost over. <laughs> no, we we don't have any time. Oh, okay. Thingy here. Um, unless you have some time things like Maria, who had to leave see you in case you're still here. <laughs> um, yeah, but should we maybe do you do we have some uh, some other slides that come as well that you wanted to talk about, or should we get into some? Well, other I, what I just want uh, maybe basically the 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 people who are who are attending to to. Um, well, to know is basically that CraftCon works on, on really a variety of different tasks. So we have um, inductive node level, we have transductive node level, we have um, craft level um, regression, we have craft level classification, and it just works really, really good on all of those. Um, so basically, yeah, my, my final slide and, and conclusion would be just in, in, in red blue. Um, please don't, don't, don't stack naively, just, just try CraftCon. Um, 
you know it, it's more or less exactly the same the same uh, uh, speed um so it, it it won't hurt and probably it will give better results um so this is really the main message of it just just try it out the the code will be published very soon and you will see that the code is actually very very simple to implement i mean it should be pretty uh, like whatever gnn you have right you can just add these skip connections that you have and yeah i see it as a different um or i don't see it as that but if you then want to re-implement it um or you want to use it for your own framework or your own gnns then just try this sort of skip connection as well as just usual skip connections exactly. yeah. um, um, but, of course of course what 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 you basically have in mind now is just this Euler discretization right the semi implicit Euler discretization no of course what that... i have in mind is what you wrote a few slides before like of course it's not just the skip connection because you like have this additional saved term the y um the y n but right in the end, you can also see it as a skip connection. There are skip connections involved, but what I wanted to say is that um, this is just one way to discretize the system, right? I can also write down a fourth order or fifth order Runge Kutta, which would just take five slides probably to write down all the equations you need just for one update. But there you also have just many, many skip connections, but the underlying is really the ODE system. So of course, like like if you use it in practice, you should probably use just the semi-implicit Euler, and you just have this one skip connections in there. But yeah, like like the, the what is really underlying is the ODE system of this this coupled oscillators coupled to the graph. Yeah. So it's a it's a cool motivation. Uh, yeah. All right, but uh, now maybe first of all, thank you for for coming here and discussing. Thank you, David. Great. I. I understand a lot more about the paper now. I was more, yeah, basically uh, was missing a lot of understanding, but maybe a few practical questions. So, in your, uh, if you go to some results slide where you have like GUT and GraphCon GUT, um, what is your GUT layer number and your GraphCon GUT layer number? How many layers do you have? So for those, so it, it varies like like for those easier node level tasks, we yeah, just did some some hyperparameter fine tuning. So we just tried bigger guts, smaller guts, and the same for Krafcon gut. Um, we share layers, we don't share layers, we just try to, to get um, the best out of all those methods. But is it always the same or is it always larger or is it always smaller? Um, I think in in because we did so many experiments, we didn't really see a trend. Um, okay. Sometimes it really helps to be larger. Sometimes it really helps to be very small. Um, but what was interesting is that for the MNIST task, for instance, we um, just just used exactly so we we use the same number of parameters for GUT and for Krafcon GUT, and we share basically the parameters um, through the layers. Uh, so that means. This gut and this Krafcon gut have literally exactly the same number of parameters. There's no difference at all. So the yeah. only difference here is the, the dynamics of how you stack them. And well, you can gain a lot, right? If you look at those, those numbers, um, Krafcon GCN and GCN looks insane. So going from 88 to 98 is, is really insane. But you can, um, if, if you use some kind of, this is gated GCN, which also has residual connections, so you can do a bit more fancy GCN and then you can get better results. Uh, but plain GCN really just gives you 88, which is mm -hmm. not good. <laughs> uh, I think it's very interesting. And uh, especially like there are some data sets where just doing this trick, but sticking with GAT and with GCN, you're able to massively improve the results. Uh, like I think you showed the, the Zinc data set uh, where the MAE dropped by half and uh, the uh, Texas, Wisconsin and Cornell where uh, the results like improved by, by a lot. Um, and the question here that I'm wondering is like, right now you use the, this GAT and this GCN, which are among the worst performers in these tasks. And you get something that is among the top performers or even 
the top performer on the, the given task. So the big question that probably everyone wants to know is like, now what if you take something more powerful than GCN and, and GAT, like uh, to where, like to what level of uh, expressivity and performance can you reach with this method? Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, that's super interesting. Um, I think we didn't do many experiments in this direction because we were already overwhelmed, right? We, we, we tried GET, CraftCon GET, GCN, CraftCon GCN, then we tried CRAN, basically CraftCon CRAN and so on. And we, we kind of stopped here because we already got really, really good results. So we didn't really see that, that we have to use more involved um, GNN architectures. But actually for the, the MNIST, because it was also pointed out by some reviewers, just um, why don't you use something more, more involved than GCN and GET? Um, it's, to be honest, I didn't have a lot of time fine tuning. So the results, uh, they are better. So I didn't fine tune it at all. I, I, I was just running one or two networks. And so one with Chin and one with CraftCon Chin, and you can improve. It doesn't look like the improvement at G, uh, for GCN or GET. Um, but here, the, the fine tuning was also a bit more, uh, more carefully done, but you can improve. Uh, what we haven't done is, for instance, on sync, there are some state of the art methods, DGN, or I think this, these days it's this um, uh, Wise Feller Lehman Go Cellular, or whatever those methods are. I think it's also from Pronstein or Pron Pronstein's group. Um, uh, we didn't use or we didn't try it on sync, but it would be super interesting actually to try it. Um, I think that there could be some some nice follow up work to to really empirically just just check out um, if we can improve also with like much more involved um, architectures and at the same time maybe have some some kind of nice theory about the expressive expressivity or the expressive power of of CraftCon. Um, I think that could be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, because one thing also that I'm wondering, um, like uh, all these papers from uh, Bronst, uh, from Bronstein's group, they all have this uh, Weisefer Lemon uh, examples, like uh, not not example but theory about like how they help improve on, on that. Uh, but here, like in terms of expressivity regarding the Weisefer Lemon test, um, there's no improvement, right? Like. Uh, you're still limited to to the same um, to the same expressivity as before, or can you detect more complex sub substructures in the graphs? I think I I hand over to Ben again because um, I am not really familiar with uh, this this concept of expressivity through Weisfeller Lemon. Um, well, I I, I, luck I, to you. I just observed that. Yeah. Um, is my mic on? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 Your mic's on. Uh, I just observe in GraphCon the only place you get a coupling between nodes is in is in the one place where you drop in a GNN module. So I, I, I'd say that you wouldn't likely be able to identify substructures because that's the only place where you have the coupling. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> So if you cannot identify uh, new substructures and like um, the, it, the basically the expressivity of GraphCon is limited also by the expressivity of the, the uh, GNN that you use with GraphCon in some sense. Uh, so seeing already that like uh, you're having this kind of improvement on Zinc, whether other methods like that that are in the same range, they often have that they, they are often better and the Weiss Van der Lemon. Um, but um, yeah, I would like to ask like, in summary, what can you say that allows GraphCon to help to, to give this kind of improvements compared to like uh, just the, the regular GCN? Like what makes GraphCon so good? Like, is it, we discussed about the, the over smoothing, but uh, on many of the, the data set that you show, maybe oversmoothing is not actually the problem. Like we know, for example, on Cora that uh, oversmoothing actually helps, but yet you see improvement. So like what, what allows really GraphCon to make this massive improvement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. Yeah, that's true. For instance, on Cora, we need high damping, which kind of 
helps for to get to oversmooth a bit, right? Um, and it's true. It's not only that we can mitigate oversmoothing. Of course, we can go deeper, and usually uh, the um, expressive power just increases, but not by a lot. So, and for instance, on sync, it's it's craft level, right? Even if you would oversmooth, as long as you oversmooth to different positions in in a feature space or state space, like no one cares right um so for sync it's not not really an issue um but i think the the main the main reason why craftcon works so much better than normal stacking is the connection to the fixed point iterations what i showed in the very last slide about our theory before the results that the normal stacking is really doomed to converge towards maybe not very expressive fixed points of the dynamics right so uh, and craftcon just has the ability to basically explore the, the space around those fixed points. And they are with high probability. I mean, we, we have no, no mathematical uh, formula on that, but I, I imagine that with high probability, there are much richer states, which lead to much better results just around those steady states, right? And uh, CraftCon is literally able to just explore the, that space around that. So I think that that's like the argument for why it works so much better in many cases. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have, have uh, a formal proof on that. <laughs> yeah. And um, why, like, why is it better exactly at exploring the state? Is it um, because the, it's uh, smoother dynamics? Like, uh, it, it's just the the qualitative behavior of the dynamics, right? Um, so, so of course, you, you have to to analyze it. What we have been doing in the appendix a lot. Uh, like with this oversmoothing and where does basically those those dynamics around the steady states where do they go are they really exponentially stable or not but what we just just found out is that um, they they don't go exponentially fast to those steady states they they just have the chance of exploring around but this is just just because of the ode system this also has nothing to do with the discretization so the skipping connections just come from this ode system so this is really just about the qualitative behavior or the structure of the ode system we have of these oscillators okay great and also a question that comes in the chat like uh, did you compare for example GAT and gcn with the re residual connection with a regular one yeah okay. yeah so for, for instance here uh, gated gcn is actually residual uh, gated gcn so with a residual connection you get good results but you know just play craft on gcn with the plain gcn gives better results so yeah we we, we compare it to that it helps for gcns um but craft con is still better okay yeah. okay because typically like we see all these uh, graph neural network methods using skip connections so like um if what, what you're proposing like what, what you're proposing seems like a um, fancy uh like more like a fancy skip connection but very well uh physically physically and mathematically uh like derived so i guess since residual connection are like default in almost everyone's code nowadays like i think it would be great to see like how it performs compared to that mm -hmm. uh, on other data sets that's true yeah, yeah. yeah. So, especially yeah. like with mnist you get all this score everyone is in 90 something 95 and more so you don't mm -hmm. see the big uh, gap yeah yeah that's true here for sync i'm not too sure if the gated gcn results are actually with residual connections probably but i don't know but you're right so it would be super interesting just to check like um how oh, it compares on a variety of data sets to yeah. just residual connections here the pna yeah. for example should have skip connections right yeah pna and dgn have skip connections so here like you see that there's a, a big improvement but like uh, let's say having gcn having gcn plus res and having graphcon plus gcn i think like it would show like uh, a uh, I think we will still see the massive gap with the GraphCon, uh, but like it would be good to see like uh, how it compares to to regular one. Yeah. Um, anyway, can we quickly go a slide back? Uh, okay, two slides. <laughs> yeah, here the um, 
like I know for, for small molecules, what sort of the super good networks are that everyone uses, like DGN is, can maybe be considered state of the art for uh, for a bunch of different molecule tasks, or maybe uh, um, some graph transformers in, in some case. Um, but here, um, like what is the things that people usually or that are very good for these types of networks uh, or citation graphs or larger graphs does anyone know i'd say low pass filters um with so we had some success with our papers grand and blend um they essentially run low pass filters that give you diffusion um, but then if, if you can make it anisotropic diffusion, so for example, Grand uses attention to cut off edges, it means you get clustering in, within communities. Um, okay. so I guess Grand, Grand, Grand at the bottom, I guess, and then Graphcon just makes it better again. Yeah, okay. And so you're saying that's like GAT v2 basically with, with Grad, Graphcon is around the state of the art uh not get v2 uh grand, yeah, well then grand. just friend which is basically the same i think right oh uh, yeah so get, get v2 is in the the updated attention mechanism yeah but the effect basically is the same you now have dynamic attention i don't think the difference is so big between um like where you now put your linear layer or your linear layers in between gut and uh, the Vasavani attention in, in gut. I, I guess uh, the, the observation relating to GraphCon that Constantine made is you need different levels of dampening for the homophilic and the heterophilic cases, uh, which essentially goes between diffusion. Uh, Okay. Ah, by the way, that, that's also something interesting. Is your the dampening parameter that you choose, like, is it always rather around the same? Or if you tweak your hyperparameters, is that very different for the different data set? So it's not very different. And I have a figure on that in, in the very last, on the very last result slide, um, just to see if there's some sense of sensitivity with respect to the um, damp damping parameter alpha and the frequency parameter gamma. And we just used the best working craft on GCN on MNIST, SuperPixel 75. And uh, basically in orange, we fix the frequency parameter and go with the damping from zero to two. And you see it's almost the same result. Um, there's no big difference. It's, it's really, really, really robust. Uh, but if you use just a huge damping, then at some point it drops because it's it's literally just over them. It's, it's just a crazy diffusion. I mean, the, you, you won't have any oscillatory behavior anymore. It just diffuses directly. Um, so this makes physically a lot of sense. So if you have too much diff uh, damping or diffusion in your system, yeah. you, you, you won't recover all these nice features we, we proved before with uh, this oscillatory behavior. Same goes with uh, the frequency. So if you go with the frequency um, too low, then you don't have oscillators anymore, right? And then also the, the system just, yeah, it gives really shitty results. But you know, if it's like in a reasonable range, um, then it's just super robust. And I, I kind of found that for basically all experiments. So it's you can fine tune a bit, but if it's in a reasonable range, um, you won't make huge differences. Okay. Just cool. just enough. Up to my, so my best guess on the super super pixel is so usually MNIST has twenty eight by twenty eight squared pixels, right? Um, and to create super pixels, you do a, a K and N to create 75 nodes. Um, and those nodes will have, e they're either black or white in MNIST, right? Or I guess shades of gray, um, depending on the aggregation of the nodes. Um, so I think it, it's different to like a power law, like a citation network graph where you have high homophily. So it, it, it might have been more interesting, like it, if you look at this dampening parameter as we, in graphs where you change the homophily from like homophilic to heterophilic. It might mm -hmm. more than yeah, so, so for the homophilic things, um, it helped. So you, you need some diffusion for sure. 
but it's also not you don't get crazy different results if you vary this this alpha parameter by a bit uh, for for um, the homophilic things i just set it to one for all of them and it just, just worked really good if you set it to 0 0.9 it's probably yeah it probably won't change much um, but the point is for for some you're right james for some experiments you just need diffusion so setting diffusion to zero um does work as you can see here it does work for uh, mnist super pixel but it's it's not a good idea for those homophilic um, citation networks okay i guess then thanks awesome okay then thanks for having me yeah i have yeah. Uh, also a few more questions like uh, re regarding right. the work um so for example um like right now you, you're having this uh dynamic you, you're modeling your graph as a dynamical uh a system where you can have like uh basically a speed and an acceleration for each node and i was wondering like whether you analyze this kind of speed and acceleration and see like how they relate for example to uh um like uh the, the speed and the acceleration at, at each layer like is it um each uh, at each layer the each node like changes its speed and acceleration or like some nodes keep higher speed higher acceleration than other nodes and like uh what's going like um or maybe like is there some kind of uh interpretability that you can take from there or nodes that have like higher speed more important like what, what does the dynamic like you, you derive all this dynamical equation but then you you just use them for a predictive task, but uh, what can you find from the dynamic parameters that, that you that you actually derive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's actually a good question. So the first question was that if it changes throughout the layers, um, it doesn't in our case because we set it to be autonomous, so we don't have a dependency on time. It just depends on the state itself. So where it is in state space. So it doesn't depend on how long you were running the dynamics basically. Um, if you would make it time dependent, you probably would have this behavior that it just changes from layer to layer, how fast it goes to the next one for each different node and so on. Um, but in our experiments, it didn't. Um, and the second question was more about like multi-scale behavior, right? If you have a node which oscillates like a lot, and then you have a node which oscillates barely and um, how fast you go through, how slow you go through. Um, we didn't put in any multi-scale behavior um, by, by um, design. So um, there, there's nothing multi-scale happening here, um, but you can, um, well, the dynamics is not multi-scaled to put it like this, but it's a coupled oscillator. So you, you, you can maybe define um, multiple scales in a slightly different way that normal, normally people do it in the, in the dynamics or dynamical system theory um, a field or community. And then, yeah, you, you, you for sure have, have like um, multiple scales in the, qualitative parameters of your oscillators meaning amplitude meaning um, uh, um like like frequency and so on because this is also just modulated by this this coupling term which is learned right um but it's it's not inherently multi-scale but to be honest um we are looking at that right now so there is something really interesting going on and uh, if you make it multi-scale you have to be careful you can't just put some multi scale uh, in front, but if you do it like in a clever way, you can gain a lot. And yeah, this is this is basically something uh, we are or I am currently looking at. Um, but yeah, so it's not not yet in CraftCon by design. Yeah, I, so I do. I, I, uh, go on, go ahead. Sorry, um, I'd also say um, the coupling is determined by the adjacency that you're given, right? So. Uh, again, to go to this idea of a homophily heterophily, if you have two nodes that are potentially of a different label class, you might expect to see larger amplitude or acceleration versus if two nodes are in the same label class, you might expect for them to be quite calm and stable. So I, I guess, yeah, like just, again, you can have this idea of rewiring so you can replace the, the given graph with another graph and then you'd have different couplings. So you might see different behaviors. Okay. And you're saying that you're looking right now at this uh, amplitudes and frequency and multi-scale. 
And, yeah, uh, more like the multi-scale of the dynamics than, yeah. than because yeah, multi-scale systems don't need to be oscillators. You you can apply it to oscillators, of course, but uh, so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm currently more interested just in plain multi-scale dynamical systems. So. And uh, just a teaser for when we have you in a couple months uh, to present your new work. So is it nice. something interesting or uh, like do, do you observe uh, something interesting on the multi-scale dynamics or? Yeah, so so far I get, and I, I can't really explain it, um, wh why it works, but on one of the big heterophilic data sets, uh, Squirrel or Film or something, um, we improve state of the art by such a lot that I, yeah, it's, it's normally it's just, you know, you go from 55 to 56.5 or something, but here we really went from 54 to 65 or something. So just, just a huge gain. Um, it's 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 currently I'm still working on it. So, um, but but yeah, I think there there are some some really interesting directions. Also, multi scale systems. You know, um, I mean, my background is is basically math and applied math and physics. And um, so, what what also my supervisor Siddhartha Mishra, he's he's a mathematician and a physicist, is really interested in is in multi physics behavior, right? Um, and uh, well, there are just some super interesting connections between between those things. And no. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And thanks again for for the great presentation today. I uh, really enjoyed like uh, learning more about this paper, and it's uh, very very different from like what the rest of the community in GNN is doing. So, uh, and with great empirical results, great theoretical results. Um, yeah, and I especially enjoyed the discussion. Maybe one more question by Francesco. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I still uh, didn't understand. So you, uh, your network converged to a, a, sing, a single value, no? a stable value, no. I assume, no? Still going up and down. So yes. my, yeah, my question is if you understand uh, the role of the, because you have a loss function on the labels now, and then you, uh, you have the dynamic which is independent of the label. So, and I suppose the loss function is uh, is moving the feature on oscillate on, uh, on oscillating in some strange way. Did, did you understand? You had an intuition of what's happening. Mm. between the oscillation and the loss function well yeah that, that's actually interesting um so yeah so if, if you just do uh sgd um you change the parameters of the coupling function right and um so the dynamics just changes like a lot so you still have oscillators it's still an, an oscillatory system but um the dynamics can change just in super crazy ways and we have not analyzed that, but um, this this is maybe the the one of those um, interpretations that you know you would think like okay now we have this oscillatory behavior so when do we know when we are done you know like do we have to run the dynamics for ten time steps do we have to run it for a hundred like when do we know we are done because it's not diffusion right it 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 doesn't it doesn't reach like a steady state in some sense so um, and the answer is literally just pick something you like. Which you know, given some kind of kind of uh, optimal control idea, shouldn't be too small. So you shouldn't have something uh, uh, time time interval from zero to zero one, uh, but from zero to one, it, it's totally fine. Or from zero to two, and then just run SGD on it, and uh, it will find basically a, a good dynamics in between, such that you know you explore like rich rich set of states, such that you can approximate functions in, in a very involved way. So, so you don't stop uh, this uh, Euler system to a, say a optimal uh, time. You just stop any any time after a, a certain time. So, so you haven't compare. Let's say if if you stop uh, one step bef uh, before and one step after, or I mean. Well, we did some hyperparameter tuning. Um, I mean, it's the same like asking, should I use a two-layer GCN or should I use a four-layer GCN, right? It's literally the same question. Um, 
And of course, we did initially some hyperparameter tuning. I think for Cora, PubMed, and Sites here, we did actually fine tune it by just a bit. But I think actually I just used the same uh, time intervals like uh, they had in Grant. And um, so I, I found that it's just not very sensitive with respect to how long you run the dynamics, given that you just run it long enough, right? As, as I said, from an optimal control perspective, you uh, need to to let your your initial states evolve to something which is expressive right so just stopping the dynamics after like like epsilon small or tau small uh, time is just not not good enough but if you run it for a reasonably long time it it won't change much so it's not very sensitive to that and you also experiment with different activation functions, I suppose. No? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. We did pun H, real U, ALU. Did you observe yeah. difference in the activation function? Yeah, but this was mostly because of what um, coupling function we used. So if you use GCN, I used real U, which worked the best. If you use GAT, we used ALU, which, you know, apparently in, in the community, it just works best with, with GATs and, and so on. So it was more like what works for the, the G, GNN layers we use. Um, for the coupling, just also works for the dynamics. Okay, thank you. Perfect. It's worth pointing out the pic the picture on the screen is 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 actual dynamics from a graphcon, uh, but because the features are in two dimensions, it's just you you can't really learn to solve a problem. So they're just randomly initialized weights, but that's that's actual a graphcon rollout. So yeah, it, it would be interesting if you could have a a meaning meaningful two dimensional learning problem you might see interesting dynamics evolve in, in that no no i agree all right but let me make a last question will any of you be at icml in person i will actually i already booked <laughs> perfect see you there awesome perfect all right then thank you again very much for the invitation i really enjoyed it and yeah see you at icml i guess <laughs>